Hello and welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. I'm your host, Pharma Forum Editor-in-Chief Jonah Comstock. I'm joined today by Dr. Nora Abul Hassan, Vice President of Genomic Health at 23andMe. We're going to be talking a little bit uh, broadly about uh, this genomic health space, what it means, and also about some new data 23andMe has, has collected recently about how uh, folks inside the industry are thinking about the space. Welcome to the show, Nora. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, Nora, first of all, uh, I, I think, I hope, uh, our listeners are familiar with 23andMe. You guys were sort of the first vanguard of, of direct-to-consumer genomic testing, um, at least for health. I, I know you may have been slightly predated by one of the Ancestry services, but, um, you know, huge leaders in that space, in, in that um consumer oriented omics space and also in in generating this genetic data for for research purposes how does your role in your business unit fit into everything that 23andme does now in 2023 yeah I, I do think many people are familiar with at least some aspects of 23andme um and you know i always like to say that 23andme put genetics on the map really for people uh, in in a way that it just hadn't been recognized as being so powerful before. Um, but the company has also changed over time. And that's how I fit into the picture. The um, 23andMe, you know, has been around and has been offering genetic information to consumers uh, for many years now. And many people entered this experience for reasons like to learn about their ancestry, um, and, and other things like traits. And more and more, as the field of genetics and genomics was evolving, there was a recognition that genetic information can give us a very deep understanding of our health and our potential risk for diseases. And so that started to shape the way people were interacting with their genetic information uh, in a very different way. And so over time, in addition to providing this access to genetic information, 23andMe has been wanting to do more to get people to truly benefit from everything that their genome can tell them. And that means, how do you get the genetic information to inform health and disease? Uh, and that's where I come in. I am the vice president of genomic health, as you mentioned. And this is a, a new role, and uh, my goal is to build out this clinical experience, this knowledge base for how genetics is informing health, how can we prevent disease using this information, how can we help uh, patients, providers, consumers uh, benefit to the maximum potential of genetic information. So to that point, you guys recently fielded a survey um, about um, among physicians in, in, in the U.S. as, as well as as individuals, patients, I guess, all of us, um, about sort of how people are feeling about the role of their genetics in their health, about the role of genetic testing in health. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what, what we learned there and, and what it means. Yeah, we, we learned a lot of really exciting things from this survey, which, as you mentioned, was surveying both physicians, primary care physicians, and also um, people who are patients. Um, about their understanding of genetic information and how it influences uh, healthcare. And, and this isn't the first time that 23andMe has uh, done this type of survey. Uh, and what was really interesting to me is how things have changed from a healthcare provider perspective over time. Um, so this time, when we surveyed primary care physicians, the vast majority said that they felt that genetic information was important and that this could really be, uh, you know, this wasn't exactly what they said, but I'm paraphrasing, but that this was a really powerful tool in the landscape of healthcare. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of reflected a change in how genetics has impacted healthcare more broadly. Um, and what I mean by that is even five years ago, much fewer healthcare professionals who were not genetically trained, who were not geneticists or genetic counselors, were seeing the impact of genetics and how they provided care for patients. Uh, and, and that was reflected in previous surveys where we saw that uh, I think the three in 10 doctors had seen patients on a regular basis with, where genetics played a role 
in that patient's management. And that has substantially changed over time because the truth is that genetics does actually impact all areas of medicine. And we know that now much more than we did a decade ago or five years ago. And so many more doctors now have seen patients uh, where they realize that genetic information is an important aspect to how they might want to consider a diagnosis or management or treatment for that patient. Um, so there's that increased awareness of how genetics is impacting healthcare, uh, and there's the increased amount of research that has led to us using genetics in a meaningful way in the healthcare space. So our genes, you know, contain all the information about who we are, or or at least a lot of it. Um, it and as you say, you know, the, the the attitude around genetic testing has changed, and it used to be like an extra test that you would order under a specific circumstance to, to answer a particular question. Um, what's interesting to me about genetic testing now and its role in sort of precision medicine is this idea that like you can learn things not just to answer your question, but uh, what questions you should be asking or what conditions should you be looking out for. Um, so, so talk to me about like how from your perspective, like how ought we be using genetic testing in, in treatment? Um, and, you know, how do we sort of unlock its, its full potential and also, you know, create a kind of convenient and simple workflow for doctors and patients? I love that question. Um, it's something that, you know, I think about day in, day out, day out. So I should have said also, I'm an internist and medical geneticist by training. And I think it's really interesting how, as you say, genetics was very much uh, used in a diagnostic setting where a patient had turned up because of something about themselves, a personal history, a characteristic that somebody suspected might be genetic or a family history that led someone to believe there might be a genetic underlying um, risk for them uh, based on their family, for example, in the cancer space. And, um, and so there is a field of medical genetics that has long focused on rare diseases, on pediatric conditions, on cancer risk, uh, and more and more uh, areas of medicine. Um, but the idea was always that the patient was turning up for a reason. And it was indication-based testing with the goal of figuring out whether there was a genetic etiology underlying that reason for their coming to care. Things are a bit different now. And what your question points to is how can we use genetics in a way that's preceding a patient coming in for a specific reason? And this is the area of genetics that truly does have the most potential to change healthcare because it becomes a tool that you use early on in hopefully healthy people to understand what they're at highest risk for and then take action to prevent those diseases that they're at risk for from happening or make the earliest possible diagnosis in someone who might not be outwardly showing signs and symptoms of the disease. And for people who have a condition already, how can genetic information best inform how to tailor their care? What medications might work best for them? What should be, we be worried about in terms of different things they're at risk for, how this disease might progress? And using genetics in the, that way, and I, I like to call it a you know, genetics first approach, is extremely powerful as long as you can identify accurately what people are at highest risk for, what they should be worried about, and then provide them with knowledge for what to do with those risks and provide, I should say, them and healthcare providers who may not be as accustomed to using genetic information in this way with the next correct steps for action. And and the other piece of it, uh, you know, at, at PharmaForum, obviously, we write a lot about uh, drugs, about oncology. Um, and, and there definitely seems to be this idea that, you know, historically, you might have two drugs and some of them, one, some patients, one works, some patients, another work, you didn't really know why. So you just had to sort of trial and error. And that's a lot of how prescribing still works. Um, is, 
I mean, is genetics an answer there? Is it looking like it could be in some cases? Absolutely. Um, we, we have long used um, a one-size-fits-all model to, to prescribe medications that usually work for the majority of people with a certain disease or certain characteristics. Uh, but we know uh, those medications won't work for everyone. They may have adverse effects or side effects in some people. And there is a, um, an entire field of genetics called pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics um, that addresses that. What are the genetic variants that influence whether a person is going to metabolize a medication too quickly or not quickly enough, and whether there are more risk for side effects. And you can make better choices knowing that information before you prescribe a medication. So rather than trial and error, uh, being more informed to make the right choice for the right person at the right time uh, is a really powerful approach. Again, it relies on having the genetic information up front, though. Sure. Uh, and, yeah, and, and you're right, we don't actually do that. Uh, for the vast majority of cases in healthcare today, uh, this has not been routinely implemented, uh, but there's a lot of enthusiasm to do that. And there, you know, there's FDA labeling on certain medications uh, saying that pharmacogenetics is an important factor to consider. Uh, so I could see that as being something that we move towards uh, hopefully sooner rather than later in healthcare. Broadly speaking, when we talk about sort of this new approach to genetic testing, how do we get from here to there? Uh, what are some of the barriers? And, and you know, a system-wide change is always hard, especially, you know, in something like medicine. Yeah, system-wide changes are certainly uh, challenging. And, you know, genetics has its complexities. And I think that's where you could think about uh, a company like 23andMe, where we have been communicating genetic information directly to consumers in a way that's understandable. So, uh, you know, we do studies to make sure that the vast majority of people getting results in this way are able to comprehend uh, the results and, and, and therefore should be able to make actions based on those results. Um, so, so then you have them. We have over 13 million people who have genetic information, including pharmacogenetics for certain variants that we know influence medications. And now we need for that next step to happen. Uh, and so it can happen either because a patient is coming to their healthcare provider and the healthcare provider wants to prescribe something like a lipid lowering medicine or an antidepressant, and they become aware of a pharmacogenetic consideration that they want to apply to better inform their prescribing decisions. Um, so that's one way that could happen um, because of the genetic information was there. At the, at the right time. Um, you know, the other way that, that it could happen is to ask for pharmacogenetic testing more widely. Um, and there are cases uh, where it makes a lot of sense. We do in healthcare prescribe medications that could have toxic uh, and deadly effects in some people that we could potentially uh, reduce the risk of that happening if we were to implement a you know, test first, pharmacogenetics first approach, and then prescribe. Um, that, that's the kind of system change, though, that's going to require a pretty heavy lift from a healthcare system side. But there are lots of people pushing for that, especially based on uh, even more recent evidence from uh, just a few months ago showing that you could potentially prevent 30% of serious adverse events uh, in patients if you had pharmacogenetic information to guide prescribing decisions. And genetic testing, it, we, we sort of, and this is almost too obvious a point to mention at this point, but it's gotten massively cheaper and easier to do than when, obviously, like when it was first discovered and people were first talking about, you know, sequencing the human genome. But how, like, how accessible is it at this point? Like, is it something that could just be done at everyone's, you know, annual physical or... I think it depends. Um, there are barriers to widespread access to genetic testing today. You're right, the cost has uh, dramatically decreased, but that doesn't mean everyone is able to access it. Uh, and you know, reimbursement for genetic testing is still quite variable and often limited to specific indications and guidelines for who ought to get tested for which genes and under what circumstances. 
Um, and, you know, that's the one barrier having to do with really broadening access to all individuals who might benefit from, um, from genomic medicine. And then, you know, having a healthcare provider workforce that's really well informed and feels comfortable to bring in genetic testing into routine care is another uh, and is another barrier that many education and training initiatives are attempting to help uh, reduce that barrier to implement genetics in this way, uh, but we're st still not quite there yet. Um, so, you know, something that we think about at 23andMe is this opportunity to increase access to genetic information. Uh, it's There are multiple solutions to this complex problem that many people, I think, are trying to solve. Of course, the other another barrier um, is is just kind of personal comfort, discomfort, and and privacy considerations, right? Because your obviously your genetic information is is deeply personal and uniquely identifiable. Um, I, I know early on when this started to be discussed, there was a lot of concern about like keeping this information away from the insurance companies so they couldn't you know deny you coverage for a pre existing condition because it was in your genome. I mean, some of that has not really borne out, it feels like, over time, but I'm sure there are still a lot of things at 23andMe, the, the you know best practices you guys do to make sure that you're staying on the right side of those issues and everyone is, is safe and, and comfortable, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the privacy aspect is a really important one. We take that very seriously at 23andMe, recognizing that our customers are trusting um, the company to take appropriate actions around privacy and ensure that. So this is something that we absolutely take very seriously um, and make sure that genetic information is only used in, in very appropriate ways um, in the company. And, you know, to your, to your other point about how can, could this potentially be used um, from, from a standpoint to discriminate against people who are seeking out insurance, for example, uh, there are federal laws in place to prevent uh, insurance discrimination for health insurance uh, for people who have undergone genetic testing and find out they have a genetic risk for something. Uh, there is something called GINA that prevents uh, health insurers from discriminating against people using that information. Good. It's good to hear that we got that one right. <laughs> someone, someone took the steps. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I will say that uh, Gina covers health insurance, but uh, people need to consider other things like life insurance and disability that may not be covered under that federal law. Um, but employment and health insurance are things that are covered. So what haven't we discussed yet that you think is, is important or interesting um, about the, the work that you do, especially for a pharma audience? Uh, for Yeah, from a pharma audience, I love the pharmacogenetics aspect of things. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, I'd love to share is uh, our recent efforts in thinking about how do you scale the use of genetic information in healthcare. Um, and it, about a year and a half ago now, 23andMe uh, acquired a telemedicine company called Lemonade uh, to try to really make an impact in this space. Uh, so we now have uh, colleagues who are clinicians uh, working in this telemedicine platform that we can collaborate with to allow access to people who, with genetic information to seek guidance around their reports. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about and are continuing to build out uh, such that for example, if you were to be a 23andMe customer and find out that you had a variant in BRCA1 or BRCA2, the BRCA genes that are putting you at higher risk for cancers, and you're interested in speaking to a genetically informed healthcare provider about those risks, that previously could have been a barrier to having the next steps for guidance and, and consulting with someone who is well-informed in the genetic space on what to do next. Um, so now our customers do have an ability to uh, seek out that kind of genetics informed care through this platform. Yeah, that's that's super important, um, definitely, and, and if, especially like given the unique position that you're in, having all these direct relationships 
with consumers who have used 23andMe to, to get information about their genome, to now be able to say, like, here's a resource that you can talk this through if you find this out, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that uh, for a long time ha- has been, you know, a-, a top of mind for the company because it's hard for people who get genetic test results in a direct-to-consumer way to then find healthcare providers who are knowledgeable enough and willing to address those results in healthcare, in traditional healthcare. And so it's, you know, one way to provide a path for a next step for people to go and get some guidance, uh, recognizing that, you know, as we talked about before, there's a more systemic need for increasing how we use genetic testing appropriately in clinical practice. Uh, But this is one way that I feel like I'm really excited that we're making a difference um, through this platform and through our education initiatives more broadly, where we can offer uh, information for healthcare providers outside of our ecosystem to learn more about genetic testing and genetic test results and how to use those. So, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of the what what can be sort of what needs to be done and what can be done to kind of get more genetic testing more more freely available. But maybe we can go back and talk a little bit about some of the kind of benefits here in terms of like, it's, is the vision here that folks are going to find out about, you know, conditions they never knew they had earlier and, and be able to, you know, seek earlier treatment and, and potentially like more effective treatment for conditions? Well, maybe I can give an example. And I think this is I think this is an important topic that we can spend a couple minutes on because, you know, we think about genetics. I gave the example of BRCA1 and 2, and then those are really impactful genes, and we know they're linked to different types of cancer risks. Uh, and and people, for the most part, if if they have those variants in those genes, there are next steps for, for them to reduce their risks. Um, but, but that's for like a, a very specific type of cancer syndrome. Now, in the last decade, we have uncovered ways to understand genetic risks for many common and serious health conditions, um, in, including things like heart disease and diabetes, uh, other types of cancers. And every week or so, there's more data informing us on how you can actually combine someone's genetic risk information from across their genome to tell a person where do they fall on that risk spectrum? Are they at the, you know, do do they have a high likelihood of disease in comparison with the population for that particular condition? Or is it not something they need to be as worried about compared to other conditions they might be at risk for? So, uh, you know, these, these types of scores, they're called polygenic risk scores are increasing in number, in the types of conditions they address, and in uh, interest from a clinical standpoint. Because now we're not talking about, you know, one to 5% of the population. We're talking about uncovering health conditions for whom everyone in the population is at risk for. And we are trying to help ascertain which risks are the most relevant to you as a person. Is it heart disease? Is it kidney disease? Is it liver disease? Uh, And, you know, if it is any one of those things or more, what are some of the things that you might want to do to reduce your risk? So I think that's a really exciting and burgeoning field of medicine because of its applications in preventive health. Because in my view, if you're in your 20s, you're probably not thinking about your risk of heart disease uh, and having a heart attack in your 50s, um, unless potentially you had a family member who had a heart attack when they were very young, then maybe you're already hyper aware of that type of risk. You know your cholesterol levels, you're seeing a preventive cardiologist, like you might be doing those things. But typically, young, healthy people don't care as much about what might happen to them in the future because we don't know. And, you know, when you think about it, a lot of things could happen to you in the future. So you might as well live your life, I guess. Sure. (laughs) But if I tell you that based on your unique genetic composition, uh, what might be something that you want to consider 
not worrying about, but thinking about more than, you know, the vast array of things that may or may not ever impact you in your lifetime. That's really powerful information. So if I tell a healthy 20 year old, just for the sake of having an age there, um, that their risk for heart disease is much higher than the general population. Uh, we know now from our experience at 23andMe, but also from other studies, that that is a powerful motivator for people to understand specifically that they're at risk for something based on their genetics. They are far more likely to make lifestyle changes that are going to reduce their risk. Uh, what I'd like to see more of is this going to benefit uh, people in a way uh, that they take more clinical actions around their risk. And, you know, it might be that a physician sees a borderline high cholesterol level in a patient and thinks it's okay to wait because that's reasonable to do. Um, so wait and see, is diet going to help? Is lifestyle modification going to help uh, for a few years? But if that same physician and their patient are aware of a significantly increased likelihood of heart disease in that patient, we know now that they're more likely to initiate a lipid-lowering therapy or increase the dose of a medication and really just be more careful in how they are looking at that specific patient at that time to make sure that they're preventing disease in the long run. And that, that's a really exciting way to think about medicine. In fact, it's the promise of personalized medicine that we have long heard of with the sequencing of the human genome and, uh, and with all efforts subsequent to that. But we're not there yet. That's not how we currently apply our knowledge in this preventive health space using genetics. And to me and, and to others at 23andMe and outside of this company, that is really the full potential of the human genome. Right. But step one is to have that information. I and mean, step two is to make sure it's actually used and, and taken into account in those situations like you described. Exactly. Exactly. So you need the genetic information. You need genetically informed healthcare providers. You need people to understand what the information means to them. Um, and you need and you need access, right, to next steps and to to care around uh, th those genetic risks and so on. Well, thank you so much for talking to me, Nora. This has been super interesting. Um, and I, I've been, uh, I feel like I haven't paid close enough attention to this space for too long. So it's, it's really good to hear kind of w where you guys are and, and how you're thinking about it. Um, any other news in terms of, of next steps for 23andMe? Um, after, you know, you've done this report, you've done this acquisition that you told me about. Um, what's on the horizon for you all? Yeah, I think you can expect um, to see more, more from us in terms of really enabling our customers to benefit from the human genome. So that access part, I think we've done a lot to increase access to genetic information and, and to its relevance in health and disease. Uh, and now we're really focused on how do we take that next step to ensure that people are ultimately benefiting from that knowledge. Uh, so that that's the part that I'm really excited about, that my team and genomic health is really working hard to, to make it come true. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes this episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find more information about this episode, including a download link and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and Podme, where you can find and subscribe by searching for PharmaForum. And don't forget to visit our website, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and to follow us on Twitter at at PharmaForum. Thanks for listening. Music